everybody. Thanks for tuning into Border City Rock Talk. We get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Today, I've got Tommy Ray Brown from London, England, sitting in a coffee shop. How are you doing today, Tommy? I am blessed and feeling really cold. It's snowing. We have a white Christmas in England. Wow. Today, I woke up to snow in my garden, and it's amazing. How are you? I'm a mil- I just watched uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles the other day. I usually watch it during the before Christmas. So I'm a million dollars shy of being a millionaire, but I'm okay. Yeah, me too. So we're in the same boat. <laughs> right on. So actually, before we uh, started recording here, I was going to ask you, um, obviously the Graham Bonnet Band and, and Bethany, um, great you know, headlining, but what did you think of the Dead Daisies the other night? They were amazing. Um, you know, I knew Glenn Hughes years ago. I'm talking, I don't even want to tell you how many years ago, but, but I knew him when I first started Hard and Dangerous. Actually, I used to hang out with him when I was that person in that picture behind your head. Hey, Tommy. Um, I was about that age. Yeah. Can I get you they to speak up it. just a bit? Just speak yeah. up a bit? Um, sure. Um, Perfect. I met Glenn Hughes. Uh, I met Glenn Hughes when um, I was just a kid. I was a runaway kid. I uh, wanted to be a rock star, and um, he was one of my favorite singers. And when I saw the show the, the other night, uh, I was so happy to see him healthy and singing better than ever. Uh, he looks amazing. Mm-hmm. The band was tight. Doug Aldridge, what an amazing wow. player. Blew my mind. I mean, I, 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 I used to do uh, go see him a lot at the Rock Vault, and I sat in and sang with the Rock Vault so, uh, with Paul Sortino and stuff. So, wow. you know... To see him in his own element, not yeah. with the rock ball, yeah. but the dead daisies and Glenn yeah. Hughes. It was amazing. Yeah, it's funny how every time I do an interview, they keep growing and growing. And every time, every so often, more frequently than not, somebody brings up something that's almost um, um, a segue for me. Paul Shortino, I had interviewed um, via, this is Spinal Tap, one of my favorite movies in the world. I love his role in Spinal Tap because he literally, that's how he acts anyway. He's just yeah, he's a rock star. He always has been, right? Rough cut and rock I star. Yeah. Okay, so musically, um, you're no stranger to the business. Um, what's going on with the Tommy Ray Band? Well, um, the Tommy Ray Brown Band, uh, we were getting ready to do Glastonbury and go on tour, and then COVID hit. Mm. Uh, one of my guitar players lives in Germany, uh, and... Uh, Mark McRae is his name, and uh, he lives in Germany, so it, it got very difficult traveling. So we got the record, and we got it ready, and we had the tour ready, and it all got canceled. So now I have a thousand albums, <laughs> a mm-hmm. bunch of vinyl, and a bunch of CDs that I can't use. I just give them away at my gigs or to whoever <laughs> will take them, really. Um, but I still do shows. I play with Paul Ronnie Angel, yeah. uh, who is an uh, amazing um, guitar player, songwriter. He's one of my He's probably my, one of my closest fans here in England. And he kind of took me under his wing when I got here. I met him at a, a offbeat uh, pub where he was singing. And he put the microphone to the crowd to sing something. And I just did some gospel singing. And, and from then on, we became best mates. And uh, wow. we started the band. And, wow. Uh, so, and then we got Mark, uh, Norman Watroy on bass. Yeah. So that was pretty amazing. From Ian Drury and the Blockheads and Wilco. Rest yeah. of soul, Wilco, we just lost him. Uh, he just passed away uh, into, into the Lord's hands uh, about a week ago. So mm-hmm. my prayers go out to Wilco and his family, of course, and to my bass player, Norman Watroy. Uh, and then I just do uh, standards at like um, places like uh, Ronnie Scott's and wear a long dress. And I kind of do what James Brown taught me to do. I just sing. Right. And I love it. We'll get to James Brown in a second. I was going to try to sneak in a little segue. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, behind me, who are those cats? I'm okay. Open. Well, let's say so. If you're going to go stage right, you got Lisa Black on the lead guitar, and right next to me, in between Lisa Black and myself, is Bethany Heavenstone, mm-hmm. who is the bass player for Graham Bonnet Band, and my sister, my very, very dearest person in my world outside of God and my child. Uh, and um, over here is me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's me at about 17 or 18. And then wow. that's my drummer, Sherry, who is now in A Whole Lot of Rosies, which I think just got a record deal. 
I think Which I heard is really that. cool. Yeah, that a cover band of ACDC could get a record deal. I didn't think that could happen. Yeah, well, they do things like that do do happen. It's funny because if you can do a cover of um, it, well, it shows your talent, right? And the agents mm -hmm. and the people out there, you know, they'll notice. So yeah. well, Shark uh, Island, you know, and, and even that band that does all the '80s cover band stuff, they make so much money. Um, what is the name of the group? They play all the time in, in LA and everywhere, and they do Van Halen. And they make. You're talking about out. SP Steel Panther? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Well, I, I just they, finished interviewing Travis. Massive. I interviewed oh, Travis really? yesterday. He left the band, and the reasons are in the interview I'd uh, up, I'd uploaded, but. Yeah, but they do it with a comedy style, but they're so talented, right? I love them. They're amazing. Correct. They're in the documentary that I did um, on my husband. They're in there talking about, um, along with a lot of other people, talking about how he influenced them. Uh, but they're always such nice guys. Yeah. And what amazing players. And to put, I mean, going up with mirrors on the stage and hairspray. I mean, Sexy Lexi. Show business. It's a lost art show business. Yeah, people just don't even don't even wash their hair before they get on stage anymore. They don't think of, that the audience might want to actually pay forty quid to or forty dollars to to see a performance, not to right. see you get out of bed and you know rehearse. You yeah. know, it's show business. We want to see something. Right. They give it to us. Um, speaking about um, Harley Dangerous, um, obviously I uh, interviewed your your good friend Bethany, um, and you had Athena Lee in the band at one point. I did, yeah, I had a couple times. And who is she, in case people don't know? Who's who's Athena Lee? Athena Lee is Boomwhack, is who I call her. I call her Boomwhack because that's how she plays very hard. <laughs> boom, whack, boom, whack. She's nice. like a big mosquito when she plays because she's got long legs like Tommy Lee. Because who's she's Tommy, Tommy Lee's sister from Mom the Crew. I know. Yeah. So she's Tommy Lee's sister. So you know how when he plays, his knees go up and all you see is knees and elbows? That's Athena. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I was her first band. Uh, Bethany was also, I was her first band. We've kind of, we kind of groomed them a little bit. I sent Bethany off to another band called Bootleg um, uh, with Leona X and, uh, and Susie uh, Sirius, who was in my original band, Rocket Queen, and got her to learn how to play bass a bit. And then I said, okay, now come over here. What she learned enough, and now she's playing with Graham Bonnet, so wow. she's doing better than I am. <laughs> so let's move on to um, what's um, pretty interesting to me. I, I'm not a singer, but I feel good. Um, who's your late husband? For what people. was his late husband? What was his? No, no. Who who was he? For a lot of people, coming to this channel or for the current '80s, well, '80s hard rock. Who's your late oh, husband? Not know. Well, my my late husband is uh, James Brown. He's the Godfather of Soul, the super heavy minister of the ultra funky funk. Yeah. He is the creator of the one and three. Yep. He is what took the two and four tiptoe through the two lips. Boom, ba, boom, ba, two lips. Boom, ta, ta, ta. Yeah. You know, so um, he changed it and. Uh, he did a lot of things. He uh, he was also the first black entertainer to ever play in, in Vietnam. He lost a lot of fans by doing that because he had to go to Nixon and ask because black people weren't allowed to entertain the troops. So he had to go to the Nixon administration and ask him so he could go and play for the troops in Vietnam. And a lot of his people left him because they didn't understand what he was doing. He was doing it so he could get to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And it looked like they made it in the papers look like he was some big Nixon fan. Which, oh, of course, no. my husband was a countryman. And he believed that whatever president, he knew them all. I met a few with him, and he was very friendly with them. And he loved, they loved him as well. Mm -hmm. um, he was a countryman, but he never chose sides. Uh, he had favorites, but he would never say who they were. He just had that class. Um, and uh, I asked him once why he changed it to the one and three off the two and four. I said, how did, what really made you come up with that? And he gave me the most incredible response I was not expecting. And after knowing him a while, now I see, because he has a higher intelligence. I do believe he's a prophet. I do believe he's a prophet. I think we have many musical prophets uh, even now. Uh, he said that the earth was off its axis with the two and the four and we were about to spin out of control 
And so he had to get that beat in there. Otherwise, we were just going to spin off our axis. We had to get the one and three in there. Otherwise, we were just going to, nothing was going to ever change. It was going to keep on repeating itself. Can you explain to the lay people, me, <laughs> uh, <laughs> one in one in three and two and four, like I'm, I play guitar, but I mean, I don't know theory, but um, I, I assume it has to do with some kind of um, beat reference. Can you can you explain that for us? Okay, so if you have four beats per measure, you've got mm -hmm. one, two, three, four. If they say play it on the one, you'll bah. play it on the two. Skip, bah, bah. that's oh, okay. two, uh, 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 three, uh, okay, four. So so basically, a beat is a note or oh, a, okay. a drum hit. Whatever. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And usually it's one, da, 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 but he went, da, da, da. Oh. Yeah. Th there's the uh -huh moment for me. Yeah. I got it. And it changed everything. It completely changed music forever with Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, which was the song that actually made James Brown uh, the creator of a new genre of music, which was fun. Right. Music. Right. So, doing a bit of research on you, um, you've uh, you've you've met some pretty high-profile people. People like you said, presidents. I mean, Larry King. Um, did you guys ever? Did you ever meet Eddie Murphy? You know what? I love Eddie Murphy, and we wanted. Him, I wanted him to play my husband in the film, but James said no. He oh. said, "I'm not a funny man, and I ain't gonna have nobody funny play me. Are you too funny?" And I'm not a funny cat. I want you not to see his cat. And I'm not going to let Eddie be funny with my man. I said, okay. <laughs> Obviously, he doesn't like Eddie. So, uh, yeah, he loves Eddie. Um, we love Eddie. But he didn't want a comedian to play him. He didn't want a comedian to play him. And by the time the role came up, I think Eddie would have done an amazing job. I want either Eddie or Wesley Snipes to play him in my film. Yeah. Those are my two top choices. Eddie or Wesley, because I met him old later in life. I think Wesley Snipes will do an amazing job as James Brown uh, from 63 on, which is when I met him when he was 63. I was 26. Mm -hmm. And then I was with him for the rest of his life. So I want to document that. So um, are you in any kind of works? Like now the estate and all that uh, nonsense is behind you, thank goodness. Um, are you in any kind of conversations with any um, film companies uh, to do this movie? Actually, um, I'm having a couple conversations with people, uh, um, and I'm very thank I thank God that the family has all uh, settled on a private family settlement agreement, yep. in which I'm not I'm under an NDA, so I can't speak. But but the family has settled our differences, and we believe the legacy of James Brown is much more important than it was really just down to bad management. He had some really bad managers and. And that's the story I want to tell. You know, I was there and I watched uh, indentured servitude and I watched um, and I went to court and I put all of these people in jail. They're now not even living anymore, but they managed to steal millions from this man. They put him in prison. Um, they uh, held things over his head uh, with a third time strike. You're out because he happened to have hit one of his uh, accountants who turned out not to even have a CPA's license when we wow. went to court after he passed. Um, who uh, they were just siphoning money to Honduras, just and stealing. Even Honduras. after he died, they were signing million dollar checks in James Brown's hand. Um, so I had to go to court and fight for many years. It'll be fifteen years this Christmas since James Brown died. Wow. And uh, just about three months ago, um, the family finally settled uh, on a private settle, uh, settlement agreement. And I'm so thankful that we've done that and it's over. And now I can start to share the wonderful things about James Brown that weren't told in the film Get On Up. I mean, it told a lot about prison and his childhood, but it didn't really talk about the man himself and what he was really about or how he was later in his life. That wasn't my James Brown experience. Yeah. You know, it takes two to tango. He was not an abusive man. He was a strict man. He was a disciplinarian. He was a man's man. He was not, you know, you, you, you have to be a lady. You speak when spoken to in a company of people. You have to know your environment and, where you, and your place uh, as being Mrs. Brown. You know, it's kind of like being the first lady of funk, let's say. 
So um, I had a lot of rules and I learned so much. I just wish that I didn't buck him so much when he was teaching me, you know, because we fought a lot. But I think he needed somebody to fight with as well because everybody just yesed him. Yes, sir, Mr. Brown. Yes, sir, Mr. Brown. And I would say, no, no, you don't do that. And no, you can't do that. Um, so I think that we just have a lot of similarities. So we clicked. And he was the love of my life. I met him and I auditioned. I went on tour and I never left him. And um, until they actually took him from me and quite viscerally. Um, so, uh, yeah, I love him still. I think of him every day and thank God for him. But as you say, the movies segue. Um, I'm thinking I'm going to come and do some things. My son, our son, James Brown II, is actually the one who I've just dropped off at the studio to finish because he's finished his album already. Oh, wow. Um, I can't talk about it. But um, uh, he's working with some really big people right now, and he's finished his album already. Wow. His name is James Brown II. Yeah. And um, he's been working with, uh, we've got some really interesting uh, people that are going to be doing some things with him. Um, I've been uh, talking with uh, uh, the Marleys with the Alicon Records, and uh, my son uh, may very soon be um be assigned to artist, which he's going to have a single coming out, I think, sometime this year. And there's not too much I can say about it, but I'm really proud of him. The album is amazing. Uh, it's a very exp experimental album. Um, he's not like his father musically in the way his father is. Mm -hmm. He's more now. And um, he's not much of the dancer thing that his father was, but he is very much the work ethic and the music perfectionist. He is also uh, on the spectrum, he's autistic and uh, kind of Asperger's, my son, but very high functioning. It's what makes him work so hard. It's how he copes, is through his music. Right. So he's very much like Post Malone. He has that crying tone in his wow. voice and he sings and he raps and he writes beats and he's amazing. That's awesome. So that now I'm kind of become a manager mom and i kind of just make sure he's healthy and i've come to realize because i'm a singing coach here now mm -hmm. in london yeah. that's what i do i do my bands i also do touring with like if the stones need a background singer if, if anybody needs a background singer I, I jump in i do the work um mm -hmm. if uh if somebody needs somebody i do the work but i i basically teach kids to sing um, so my son, what I figured is my husband was basically a breaking and training ground for me to teach my son. Because I think it's really always been about my kid. Yeah. I think my kid's going to do really great things. And oddly enough, when he was born, my husband said to me, it's no longer the lady's job to name the man child. It's a man's job to name the man child. Now you got to stay out of this just now. You got nothing to do with this now. Because it was, it was his son. And he had lost his first son. So he was he was the only child who gave his name. And he said, he's going to be president one day. This is my link into the white, white, the white people. This is really it now. Now James Brown this is everybody. And I was like, I didn't understand what he meant. He said, he's going to be bigger than I ever was. He said he was, might even be president of the United States one day. And I said, those are really big shoes to put on that little teeny, you know, 21 inch baby. You know, uh, but um, he knew what he was talking about because this kid is just a driving force. All he thinks about is, it might be the spectrum, it might be the Asperger's and, and the autism that gives him that sweetness. He doesn't know right. a lie. Um, he's, he's amazing. He's, so now I'm just, everything James Brown taught me, I'm basically teaching my kid. Does, and it's okay website? if I'm not a star. I just want my kid to be one if he wants to be one. But his album is it gonna um, would where would people find it? Uh, when do you think it will be released? Roughly, well, my son is a sneaky little cheeky. He's always put stuff up on SoundCloud, <laughs> so oh, okay. you can always find him up there somewhere. Uh, but um, he's very experimental, and um, uh, you'll be able to find it real soon. When when it comes out, they'll be doing a lot of promotion, and um, it'll be it'll be a big deal. So, uh, and we're hoping it's gonna be happening sometime around January, February. At okay. Christmas, so um, but uh, it's going to be really great. There's going to be some great features on it, probably a single, and um, and then have uh, uh, an EP, some 
teachers. The music business has changed a lot since yeah. I was in that band, yeah. <laughs> signed to Madonna's label. It's not the same. Um, the recording studios are now this computer, um, yeah. basically. Um, it's a whole different world uh, that he totally gets, and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I just want to keep him healthy, and uh, I'm basically teaching him everything his father taught me. Right. And maybe that was the plan all along. Yeah, you said you said you believe he was some sort of a prophet. So I mean, yeah. it sounds like he's coming when you when you um, imitate his voice. I mean, it's identical. If I shut my eyes, I thought I would think he was speaking. Like it's that good. You know what I'm telling you? He, you know, when uh, he told me, said, "Ain't hey, man nobody." And I've been with you five years. I've been with you five years. One, two, three, four, five. You don't know nobody that's been live with you five years. I said, okay. So on the, literally almost to the day, on the fifth year, he said, this was his proposal. I said, all right. Go on with you. It's been five years. Give me that man. And that was it. And I was like, what do I do with that? I'm like, well, I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know what that meant. And then we went and we got this. Where is it? Oh, oh there it is. No, it's somewhere. Uh, down. Okay, try it again. Oh, got um, it. This one. I don't know where my camera is. Um, you're, I'll, I'll uh, screenshot it there. But I saw there. It. Yeah. And there. My wow. And that's when I realized that meant that I was supposed to pick a place to get married. So I picked our home, and we got married at our home in South Carolina. The very home that I would be thrown out of in 2006 when he passed away, mm -hmm. uh, quite curtly. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it was a horrible situation, but I am so blessed and so grateful. I'm in this country on asylum. I must say, I'm, uh, we are here on asylum because we got a lot of death threats uh, throughout the court case. We had many death threats, and I had to move every year because they would send me mail. Um, we found you. Uh, we know where you are. You can't wow. get away from us. Uh, so it was pretty scary. So it had to be pretty intense for people to, for the United, you know, for this government to allow us to have asylum. Uh, there's a reason. Um, so uh, and then when I came out just recently, I saw the Thomas Lake CNN interview that uh, that they think that he was murdered. Um, so uh, um, if you look at the CNN uh, Thomas Lake interview and CNN. Uh, who killed James Brown. Um, it's very interesting. Um, he's always believed his last wife before me was murdered. Uh, and um, I've always believed that my husband was. So, um, you, you believed he was? I, 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 do, I do believe that there was, yes, yes, absolutely. Wow. I do. And I think that if I had been there, um, I might not be here today. For whatever, I, by God's good grace, by the grace of God, here I sit. Because, um, because uh, they really, I mean, I've listened in court to, they were little, we have to get rid of Mrs. Brown. He's not going to leave her. You know, they, they, um, they knew he wasn't going to leave her. And so he told them when I was on my way home, uh, I was in California doing a show with my band, Part of Dangerous, and I had also was getting off some medications. I was addicted to Oxycontin because my father had passed away. And I went to a doctor. And I said, I need help. I can't. I got to be on tour. I got to take care of James Brown. So he gave me 90 of these 80 milligram Oxycontins. I didn't know what they were. I stayed on them for about four years. Um, and um, then my husband put me in the hospital to get off of them. And um, I got off of them. And I said, baby, I'm going to see you. I'm coming home for Christmas. We were just getting ready to play BB Kings in New York. Because we played there two times uh, on New Year's Eve night every year. And Donald Trump and Reverend Sharpton would always introduce us because, I mean, we played Mar-a-Lago and Donald Trump was a good friend of James Brown's. And Reverend Sharpton is the godfather to my husband's other children, not to mine or to me. He doesn't like me and I don't like him. And that's no, I, I don't think he's a reverend at all. He's quite irreverent as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, so much has happened. It's been really, really quite, quite crazy. Um, um, I've lost my train of thought I, every time I think that, about it. That's him. okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. Well, you look great, so you look like you're you're at peace right now, and that's 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 the best thing, especially if you're raising uh, a, a young man. I think we got a delay here.
Are you still there? I think we may have lost. Are you still there, Tommy? Hmm. I think we lost Tommy Ray Brown. I think she logged off. Oh, well, she was in a coffee shop, and God bless her. Uh, she, uh, yeah, I'd like to get her back for a closing of this great interview. In any event, um, please subscribe to the channel so you get these great exclusive interviews. Um, a two and a four. Hi, everybody. Happy holidays. I'm really sorry um, about the video and the audio feed cutting out uh, in our uh, in our video interview today with Ernest. I'm very sorry. It is not his fault. It's all my fault. I'm a complete novice at anything that isn't analog. So uh, yeah, I'm really old school. <laughs> Uh, so I'm sorry I had so much more to say, but I look forward to seeing you again here and I will be on this channel again. Uh, so in the future, please subscribe to Border City Rock Talk and, and check out what Ernest has got going on. He does great interviews. He's got a lot of good things that he's doing for his community and um, talking to a lot of really, really great entertainers and, and all kinds of people. Um, and the like. He's just a really great guy. So, uh, yeah, Ernest Skinner, check it out at the Border City uh, Rock Talk podcasting, live video show, rock and roll, and more. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. That was all my ball. But have a very, very Merry Christmas from the Brown family in London to your family at home. We love you. Merry Christmas.